So you have three people there. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to CMS. My name is Ines. I. Ah, <laughs> Olá, bem-vindos ao CMS. É, eu chamo Inês. Uh, eu trabalho aqui no CERN como uh, trabalho na, na área de informática. E... Eu não. não. Eu sou o André e trabalho na, na parte da física, física experimental. Em particular, trabalho aqui em CMS nesta experiência. Um, eu estou no CERN há três anos, não é muito. Um, o André está cá há bem mais tempo. Olá, já lá vão 20 anos. Um... Portanto, não sei se vocês já ouviram falar uh, do LHC e das experiências do LHC. Um, CMS é uma das quatro grandes experiências que nós temos aqui. Uh, há duas mesmo muito, muito grandes e duas que são grandes, mas são mais pequeninas. Portanto, as duas maiores, que são a Atlas e CMS, têm cerca de 4 ou 5 mil pessoas. E depois as duas mais pequenas, que são a Alice e a LHCB. Ah, obrigado, Zolta. Um, cada uma só tem cerca de mil pessoas. Portanto, nós não estamos nada perto do teu local de trabalho, pois não é mesmo? Não. <risos> um, nós aqui, eu não sei se vocês conseguem ver os slides, um, mas isto pronto, é uma foto tirada daqui das montanhas. Sim, nós podemos ver os slides. Eu vejo que você representa em português. É só que eu tenho um pouco de estudantes. Dá para fazer mais. Você pode entender? Ok, eu tenho estudantes que não me Mas é ok. They will follow. They said they will follow. We can also Absolutely. do it. We can also do it in English if you want. Okay. And at least I would understand. Okay. Just not, just not Hungarian. Okay. Right. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Go as you prefer. That's fine. They, they said they, they can follow. That's okay. I can do it in English and you can do it in Portuguese. <laughs> I'm more cakes. I mean, this time of the year it's the cute cake. So yes, English is fine. All right. So. So this is a representation, the yellow line of the LHC. It's a 27 kilometer ring that we have here. And it's one of the accelerators here at CERN. Uh, it's the largest one. It's actually the largest one in the world as well. And uh, one of the things about the accelerator, so can you see the complex? Mm -hmm. So the, the LHC is uh, like the fifth gear on the car gearbox. So the beams start in the one called Linux. So it's a linear accelerator. Mm -hmm. It's and no more Linux 2. No, no, it's Linux 4. Yeah. Uh, so then they go into the booster, which is actually four accelerators. And then the beams go into the PS, the proton synchrotron. And then they go into the super proton synchrotron and then they go into the LHC. So every time it's like switching gears as you accelerate the particles. And uh, that's why many people hear about the LHC and what happens at the LHC at CERN. But in fact, the LHC uses very, very little beam uh, of uh, uh, the CERN accelerator complex. It's like two hours a day, we fill up the LHC and then we do collisions. I see your hand is raised. Yeah, just 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 a question. So go for Linux booster and then PS. Yes. Okay, and, and then SPS. Okay. And finally to LHC. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Right, and this is the this is the path to get to the LHC. But the, as you can see, there are many other paths. There are many other endpoints. There's the Zolder facility where you do not need a lot of uh, energy but you want to have a huge amount of protons because you want to make different kinds of nuclei. nuclei. So you make, um, you collide this with mercury and you try to make, uh, uh, not radioactive, but you make exotic nuclei that have different numbers of protons and neutrons. So there are lots of facilities at CERN and that is the thing that is running 24 seven most of uh, the time. I'm sorry, no IT? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> uh, and then we have these four main points that are in the LHC that you can see. Atlas, Alice, CMS, and LHCB. Okay. We are at CMS. Uh, I work near Atlas, so it's uh, quite... No, 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 go far. back. Go back. Go back to the map. This one? No, to the map. Or even to this Before. 
before, yes. or even to this one. That's an area. You can see the Swiss border also there, um, the Swiss French border. Uh, so part of our facilities are on the Swiss side, parts are on the French side. Right now we are on the French side. Um, Atlas and CMS are two of our uh, detectors. They are general purpose detectors, while ALICE and LHCB are quite Issue. more specific. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> so indeed, as Inez was saying, so this is a picture of what the accelerator looks like uh, because we have basically these 25, seven kilometers of uh, tubes and pipes and all kinds of cryogenic facilities to steer the beams so that they can collide at the center of the different experiments. And as you can see, both Atlas and CMS on the top, they are similar in a way because like they cover all around. And the other two experiments, they look more like a sort of a cone. Now, you will hear a lot of noise behind us because this is an active real control room. So there are people here. I can hear the Italian because even with these headphones, it comes through. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, and I guess you here too. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of people working here. And as Inez was saying, she works close to Atlas because there's the tram there, there's the bus, there's the restaurant, there's Geneva, there's the airport. All the cool people are there. I'm yeah, sorry. no, no, and next to CMS, mm. it's only cows. <laughs> you stay up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Inish, if you can take, shall I go? Yeah. All right, so I need to get equipped to bring you downstairs. And if Inish will... wants, she can go, of course, I'm kidding. Always. Are you? What do we toss a coin or how do we do this? Uh, no, you can go. I can go? Yes. yes. Fine. <laughs> Unless you don't come. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> it has, I, I, will, I will never say no to going downstairs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Pesha. Pesha. Okay. Um, so if you have any questions, please. Uh, Are you throwing anything because I see only the slides? Are you going somewhere? Uh, yes, exactly. They yeah, so and, somewhere, I guess. Yeah, and they <laughs> is uh, getting ready, and then he will take you underground to see the detector. Meanwhile, ha while he's getting ready, we're here in the control room, and uh, I just wanted to say that if you have any questions, you can use the Q and A. No, uh, I think they can just just simply cut in. Okay. So they are, they okay. are the only one connected. Uh, yeah. So just client, ask. So, yeah. And, exactly. So. So please don't wait for for raising the hand or whatever. Just just cut in. Just yeah. Okay, my kids are asking, what is the difference between CMS and Atlas? Well, there are some differences. Um, for example, uh, even the way they were built, um, CMS was built like these huge pieces were built inside a facility that we have just behind us, and then all these huge pieces were lowered down while Atlas was built like in like every piece just went underground and they built it in the cavern. So they were built differently. Uh, also their components are very different. Um, CMS has a solenoid magnet, which is a type of magnet, very specific. And Atlas has a solenoid and a toroidal. So it's quite different the way also that they are made. And they are meant to study the same things, the, like general purpose physics, so a very wide range of physics, but they were built differently. So we can also like cross check everything. I don't know if Andre the Atlas can hear is us. twice as bigger. Yes. Uh, in, in every dimension. So it's volume is something like eight times bigger than, than that of the CMS. Uh, though the, the, the weight <coughs> is just the half. So we weigh something like 14,000, 14 and a half thousand tons. Yeah. The half thousand doesn't matter whether it is there or not. Uh, Why the Atlas is something like 7,000, if I'm not completely wrong. Uh, <clears throat> and if we compare it with the, with the volume you have, you have an average density less than one. So if we would put cling foil around, you would float on water. Uh, our Atlas colleagues uh, are not, not happy with this uh, proposal <laughs> anyway. Um, the, the, the difference, also, yeah, go ahead. Does CMS have uh, pipes with gases too, like Atlas does? So the Atlas is, is, is more, more like filled with, with air. 
So actually, actually the, the difference between the two detectors comes from a measurement philosophical thing. Uh, we both want to measure the momentum. Let me just go there. Uh, I preempt a little bit the game. You see this blue line here. That's the, the path of the muon. And if you want to, we can measure the muon's momentum. Uh, and in order to do that, you need the magnetic field and you have to bend the path of the muon. Um, the more the bend, the more the, the deflection, you, the better you can fit a helix or, or a circle. Um, you can imagine that uh, in this you can reach with two different ways. One is that you use a very powerful magnet. And in, that, in this case, in this field, you get a, a large deflection. The other thing is that, that you use a, a less field, but you let, let the muon fly. So you have a bigger detector. So that's the two differences. In case of Atlas, if we look back to this small uh, plot here, in order to keep this monster together, you need beams, you need uh, mechanical structures. They are usually iron. The iron distorts the magnetic field. So in case of the Atlas, the, the field uh, strength varies from point to point. Uh, it's no doubt they measured it at a very high precision, uh, the highest precision achievable. <clears throat> but of course, the, the error on the measurement, but that is normal. That's what makes the muon momentum measurement systematic error. In our case, in our okay. case, in case of the, the CMS, all these things that is, well, let me, let me show. All the things that is red here is iron. We have an iron yoke around the, the solenoidal magnet, and everything is designed such a way that, that the magnetic field in the iron is uh, close or equal to the saturation field to Tesla. So it means that we have a very homogeneous field, even in the, the iron yoke. That means that we know the magnetic field very well, but the price we pay for is that we have iron. So it might happen that when the muon flies, it just interacts with the, the nucleus of the iron and it changes a little bit the direction of the flight. So in our case, this is the, the main source of the systematic error. We call it multiple scattering. Uh, However, if we both measure the dimion mass or formion mass to 127 GeV, we can be sure that what we see is really a real particle. So, and, and this is, uh, this can be told on, on the other subdetectors of, of, of uh, CMS and Atlas, that we, we use different technologies that has different systematic errors. But if we get to the same result, we can be sure that what we are seeing is correct. So there is no better detector than the other. That's a bad news. I, I would have said that the CMS is always better, but of course it is not true. There is no better detector than the other. We are both making something unique. Sorry. <laughs> No, no, I don't know if you have questions. Oh, and, and in the meantime, let me just uh, give. I don't have questions, also it's different, you have a lot. So we have two questions. One of them, yeah. is it, uh, do you say so? Uh, yeah, sure. Can you come close, right? Or just speak up. Is there a possibility that there are some things inside of the collider that you can't detect? I don't understand very well. If there's anything inside the detector that we can't detect, like any particles. Any particles. Detect. Yes, of course, there is a particle that we can't detect. That's the neutrino. The neutrino yeah. And probably the lightest supersymmetric yeah. particle, but that we cannot detect for another. Yeah, we cannot, we cannot detect neutrinos in these detectors, 
but there are actually detectors where we do detect neutrinos. Like for instance, there is a detector in the South Pole uh, where uh, mm -hmm. it is possible to detect neutrinos. Exactly. So we have we have reached the the minus okay. level. But do you have a second yeah. question? I do. I do. Uh, we have a. Uh... What was the last part of the text? It was the Higgs, or there is something else after? Yeah. So if you are talking about elementary particles, yes, the the Higgs boson is the latest or the, the latest particle that we have found. On the other hand, there are other types of particles that are composed of different quarks. And uh, of these, we've been discovering quite a few new ones, in particular in an experiment called LHCb. So, so you say you're validating, uh, LHCb will be validating TMS together on these new particles you're talking about? So the, the, these are these are particles that are composed of quarks, and we learn more about the the strong force by studying these different arrangements of quarks. So you can consider these to be particles in the sense that they are not elementary particles, but they have definitive properties. Like they have a certain charge, they have a certain spin, they have a certain mass. Thank you for that. Also, where atoms and CMS plan independently? What are? Uh, did atoms and CMS, they were planned to be built independently or they're planned like when the LHC was, they, they so already in, come up. In the beginning when the LHC was, so what happened was that CERN said, oh, we are going to build a, an accelerator and then can, you know, if you are interested, make a proposal for an experiment. And at the time, there were actually several uh, proposals. There was one called ASCOT, one called EAGLE, and those merged into ATLAS. CMS was always a concept uh, on its own. It did not need to merge. And that's also why ATLAS has an inner part and an outer part that are rather different. And so the C in CMS stands for compact, and that uh, goes back to what Zoltan was saying, that if you throw CMS on the water, it would definitely go, um, it would sink, yes. Um, so the, the, the concepts in the beginning were different. The, then there were only so many slots in the accelerator that you could put experiments. And uh, as Zoltan also mentioned, Atlas and CMS, they detect like the same things, but in very different ways. So if, if one of the ways is biased or is wrong or calibrated improperly, then the other one uh, might see it or not see it, uh, depending on uh, the mistake. So they were thought to be, they are independent. We do not talk to each other regularly. We see each other at conferences. We send joint emails to theorists like, please make a prediction. And then we both use uh, these predictions uh, each one in its own way. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to bring you into one of uh, the service caverns here in CMS. So we actually have three levels when we came to minus two. Uh, this, uh, this is a place where visitors cannot usually go. Uh, but that's one of the things that we can do with the virtual visits is to bring you to these very specific places. Like for instance, you have here the electronics uh, that controls what is in the detector and also the signals come back from the detector. So all of this is optical fibers. And then this connects to a computer where we do the monitoring and the control of uh, all of these electronics boards. So we basically have rows with many uh, cupboards uh, of electronics, racks inside. And these are not uh, the usual computers. So these are boards that are custom made for the applications that we have. And in particular, you'll see there is this part here that's called GT. So this is the global trigger. 
And what's happening is that when we are taking data, CMS, the detector is sending a low resolution version of, uh, let's say a movie, a low resolution movie that comes into a system that we call the level one trigger system. And then it acts as the brain to decide which pictures to keep. And when it decides, oh, there was something interesting that happened and information goes back to the detector and we get a high resolution picture. So we have 40 million frames a second of a movie of collisions out of which we can record 100,000 high resolution pictures. And then out of those 100,000, we can only save to disk about 10,000 a second. And uh, those are the ones that then we send uh, to the department where Inej works to please put it on a hard drive so they don't get lost. Inej, do you now, want to tell more? Uh, uh, sorry, you were saying? Yeah. Can, you, can you tell more about the storage in, in IT? Uh, yeah, well, we have this uh, data center in, um, in Mehan, so in the Swiss side where most of this is stored before it ships off to universities and researchers. Um, I think CMS uh, has like one, produces like one terabyte per second of data, something like this, which is uh, really huge. Um, I don't know if you wanna continue, Andre, because you are near the tunnel. Yeah, so we are getting, we are getting to the last place where uh, humans uh, can go to. And this is just, so just behind me over there in that corner is the access tunnel, uh, the, the tunnel that leads us to the LHC. So if we continue on the other side, on the other side, there we go. So right here is one of the safety doors. So I don't know if you saw while we were upstairs, but basically, in order to use this door, I have a dosimeter. So this records my, uh, my ex exposure to, to radiation. And then I identify myself, then the door will open towards us. And I have to go in really quickly because there is a weight sensor in here and a movement sensor. So now it's making sure that I'm alone in here. And now I get my eyes scanned. So, there we go. Now it's good. So this is a, the reason why the door, so Noemi is now coming in. The reason why the door opens in a very strange way, because you see the door opens towards you, uh, is that in case of an emergency and we need to evacuate the, the, the cavern, all of the doors open straight out. So Noemi is now in and the machine did not like the fact that she was holding the camera because uh, this machine is rather sensitive in terms of the volume that is used. Right, so now the door opens. Ta -da -ta -ta -ta. It's the machine lottery. There we go, good. And now Noemi is going to scan her eyes to make sure that it's her. And there we go. And we're ready to continue. So there is basically this seven meter thick wall between the service cavern we came from and the experimental cavern where we have the detector. So this wall is really thick because it holds the ceiling of the two caverns. It's not because of radiation or anything. It's really a civil, construction reasons. All right, so we've now entered the experimental cavern. You can see the last disk of CMS. So CMS has, uh, you can see here, it has several disks at the end, then it has wheels in the middle, and then it has disks at the other end. And so just in front of us, right over there, it's the beam pipe through which the LHC beams go through, and then they will go and uh, collide in the detector 
there on that direction. So on these disks, you can see the different types of detectors. Uh, so in this case, we have cathode strip chambers. And you see they are mounted all around uh, the detector. And on this side, complementing oh, no, hold on, the picture. Just a second. Uh, she wants to take a picture. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. Are we good? Something. Alarm triggers and battery. Are we good on the pictures? No. <laughs> Sorry, just a second. All right, fine. Sorry. Oh, so, so Thank cool. you. Thank you. Those are the subjects. Very good, very good. All right. So on the left, we have a certain type of detector, which is really good at measuring space, space in the sense of where did the particles go through. And here on the right, it's a different kind of detector, which is really good at measuring when. So it measures the time very precisely of when the particles go through. So these are resistive plate chambers, and these are cathode strip chambers. And this is one of the big things about being an experimental particle physicist is developing these detectors so that we can detect different types of particles. And now we go again where no visitors can go. Okay, so if you have some questions, I think uh, it's a good time to ask them because I'm just going to walk. And, yeah, uh, I have a couple. First of all, uh, what the different jobs do people who work in CMS hold? Oh, wait, you said in CMS? Yeah. I know okay, you turned so, it but... Yeah, so CMS, CMS is just one small part of CERN. Uh, in CMS, there are a lot of engineers. Students, engineers, physicists. I think that's the bulk. And what sort of uh, engineer? Civil, electrical, right. electronic, what's the main? So we don't have many civil engineers in CMS. There are lots of civil engineers at CERN, but not necessarily in CMS. In CMS, you have safety engineers, mechanical engineers, thermal fluid cooling engineers. I don't Whoa. even know exactly what to call those. Uh, electronics engineers. I mean, you can see uh, mechanics is used here a lot. I mean, we, we have these thousands of tons pieces that need to be pulled and moved. So there's a lot of uh, engineering and technicians uh, working in this area. Then uh, uh, electronics. I mean, you saw upstairs, upstairs in the other cavern, there are electronics here also directly on the detector. Uh, we And then we have, lots of physicists and students who build the detectors, let's say, and uh, commission them. So like, make sure that they work. Um, we have else? more questions. <laughs> go, go. Uh, is, there, is there any risk with radiation? What is the risk it, with the radiation for you? Okay, so that's, go. Inish, were, were you going okay. to answer or did I? Uh, I can try to answer, but it's more like general knowledge of people who work at CERN, but uh, usually there's no risk. When the detector is on, we can't go, we are not allowed to go, so everything is closed down. And then once uh, there's no beam, um, we then wait some time. I don't know exactly how much time it is, but we always have our dosimeters with us, and also we can carry um, active dosimeter that tells us um in real time the amount of radiation that exists but i'm pretty sure that uh, for example andres dosimeter right now it's like 0 0.02 or something like that or even zero um i don't know if you want to add <laughs> so i my my experience is that we are very serious we are very serious about uh, radiation protection we know exactly um which regions are hot. If you work in the accelerator, things are planned millimetrically, like you cannot be in a certain place for more than a certain amount of time. 
generally there is really no risk i mean like to the population and i can tell you that once i forgot this on my backpack so it came with me in an intercontinental flight and i got more radiation in that flight than in all my years at cern so if you are careful it's like uh, any other kind of risk if you go on a bike you wear a helmet so we also wear helmets because things might fall or we might fall or we might bang our heads we wear safety shoes we don't wear normal shoes because this way if a big thing falls it will not cut off your toes so at cern there's a lot of um, the idea that you use mitigation for specific risks identify the risk identify the measures and apply the measures okay uh one more question uh, how do they develop detectors that detect particles that that they don't know exist uh that's a very interesting question so one thing is particles that don't exist that's okay that's not a problem because particles that don't exist typically will decay into particles that we already know exist. This is, for instance, how we found the Higgs boson. A different thing is, how can you find particles that don't interact, like neutrinos? And there, the answer is basically the reason why ATLAS and CMS are so similar to each other and very different from ALICE and LHCB in shape. So both ATLAS and CMS have this circular shape that you can see over here that covers all the angles around the collision. And the idea is that if one of these particles that does not interact is produced, then we will see that there is energy missing or that there is momentum missing in that particular direction. And we know that energy conservation, yeah, it's really hard if energy is not conserved. I mean, we've never seen uh, we've never seen the, the law, that law of nature being broken. So whenever it looks like energy is not conserved, probably or very likely there was a particle produced that took away the energy in a given direction. Does this answer the question? Yeah, we have another one. Uh, is it possible to do what CMS does, but with a smaller structure? So if we could, we would we would have saved ourselves a lot of pain and a lot of money. Um, so the reason why it, we can't comes back to what Zoltan was mentioning earlier. We need an extremely strong magnetic field to bend particles because it's only by bending them, right? So it's only by bending them. You can see in this uh, graphic, it's by bending them that we can know what is their speed, okay, their momentum. Uh, their linear momentum. And uh, so either you have an extremely strong magnetic field like CMS, and that's why the experiment is compact and smaller than Atlas. Or if you have a, a less intense magnetic field, you need to apply it for a much longer distance. And uh, this goes back to the one of the fundamental differences between Atlas and CMS. So you see in this diagram, how different particles, depending on their electric charge, get deflected by the magnetic field. So if we, if you know, if there are smart people who can make better magnets that produce more intense fields, so that you can make smaller detectors, yes, bring it on, come and work here. We would love to get those. Yeah, I also have a comment on this. Um, we cannot show this on picture, but the internal part of CMS and Atlas are more or less the same size. And the reason for that is the calorimetry. The, the higher the, the energy of the particle, the longer or bigger this blob in the calorimeter. And uh, actually, you cannot make it as small as you want. This should always follow the, the maximum energy you want to detect. Oh, yeah, but calorimeters can be rather, calorimeters can be very compact. Actually, it's a detector where we try to stop all the particles, um, but it, it's the magnetic system that really determines. And the higher the energy of the collisions, the higher the energy of the particles produced, 
So the more magnetic field is needed to bend them. That's true. That's true. But also it should fit in the calorimeter. Yeah, we. That's right. You cannot make you a have half more the size. Okay, you guys have more questions? Yes, we have. Uh, how much electricity is consumed by CMS every time it's on? It's turned on. Oh, um, I don't know about the electricity bill of CMS in particular. I CERN, know the CERN bill. Yes. <laughs> so whenever, Close open, everything, go. whenever everything works, the accelerator complex that you saw, the big detectors, uh, the computer system, uh, my desk lamp, and my computer as well, we eat something like between 107 and 70 and 190 megawatts. It's the same as a city, right? It's it's a it's it's a something like a city of two hundred thousand inhabitants, so not too much. Indeed, we don't need a special nuclear reactor or power plant. We are hanging on the French four hundred kilovolt network, and uh, that's where we get our power from, with a with a, a emergency lag to the to the Swiss network. Oh, Luca is here, right? Do you have more okay. questions? Uh, how how rare is the discovery of new particles? Oh, uh, the doctor, doctor is, uh, <laughs> I'd say it's very rare. Well, uh, it depends. So we, of course, we don't measure the time uh, with the new particle uh, uh, discoveries. Of course, when we were built, when we were built. Well, when we we started, we planned to discovered the Higgs boson or exclude its existence. Um, the LHCB people just recently uh, um, verified the existence of, of a pentaquark. So a particle having five quarks in there. If we identify it as a real particle, why not? Then this is a new one. If you follow like um, the detectors on social media, they are like LHCB is always uh, giving out these findings. Mm -hmm. of, uh, yeah, it's it's easy to. to and also that. we sometimes we see new resonances, both Atlas and CMS, which is also part of the the standard model. However, we not yet saw anything that is outside of the standard model. We haven't seen any supersymmetric particles nor uh, uh, candidates for the dark matter, neither black holes. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, these very, very exciting things are not yet here. Yeah. That, that is right, but, that, but let's just say that the standard model for all its successes, it cannot explain things like dark matter. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to look because that is the, you know, it's the experimental way. It's the scientific method. We have to figure out what is out there in nature. And that might actually then help us build better theories. But it's not just because there is a lack of theories that we should stop looking at uh, the natural world. Now, speaking of the natural world, Noemi, okay. no, Noemi, you can show it. Uh, Manu. Um, which one of the four detectors do you think is most important and why? So the four detectors are important because they do different things. Between Atos and CMS, you could come and say, oh, but they do the same thing. Uh, the problem is that they are looking, you know, they are searching for unknown things. So if they reach different conclusions, we have a problem. I mean, when people ask me, when was the Higgs boson found? When was it actually discovered? I always go back to when I saw the results of the other experiment. And then I saw, oh, wait, they are seeing more or less the same stuff we are. So perhaps we are not completely wrong. So. LHCB has an incredibly tuned, very nice detector to study uh, particles and antiparticles, let's say, uh, so B mesons. Elise has a very nice detector 
to look at properties, you know, like, uh, let's say collective properties of the quark gluon plasma. And then Atlas and CMS have this all detectors around every single direction, no holes, no gaps in order to look for the unknown. So which one is most important? Well, it depends. If you're doing your PhD in one of them, I'm pretty sure that one will be the most important for you. But in general, for the benefit of humankind, all of them have a different task. All of them are probing something different. And now before the next question, I just want to show you something that goes back to, let's turn on the camera. So Noemi is holding uh, paper clips that I think in Brazil are called trombone, which in Portuguese, in Portugal, it's a musical instrument. And uh, the power of the CMS magnet is so large that uh, all of this material here, which is iron, stays magnetized. So it's possible to just leave the paper clips there and they will, yeah, exactly. So they are just floating. So this is how strong the magnetic field is uh, that it magnetizes all of this iron mass. And I mean, to give you an idea of the size of the iron, it's all of this. And this is why when the magnet is on, we usually don't bring visitors down here because uh, even after we turn it off, there is still a magnetic field remaining that keeps the clips floating. Yeah, but actually this time, the this is the remnant field. So the magnet is not running and the remnant field might surpass the, the um, health limit, the half a millitesla uh, very close to these uh, uh, iron beams, the green beams, for example, where uh, that are on the, the visitor platform. And that's why, why actually we are reluctant and we are always informing the visitors that with uh, uh, electronic medical implants, this place is probably not the best one they want to see. Um, by the way, once the magnet is on, we can do the same test, uh, but not with a paper clip, but rather with a spanner. I don't think I want to be there. We have a que another question. If matter and antimatter annihilate themselves, why do we have mesons? I don't know if that's related to CMS, but they are kind of off to that. So I, I was once actually in the cavern when uh, the magnet was on, and you can hold a string of paper clips that is almost 30 centimeters long, and it, they will all stay up in the air. So that's, um, and this is where the magnet. The <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think you should bring that kind of implements into the cavern when uh, the magnet is on. Well, we, we often do this. We often do this for virtual visits. I think uh, we, should, we should test it uh, sometime in next February, March. It's really a fun. Okay, flying tools, the wonderful flying tools of CMS. Of course, they are, they are tethered to you. That's a, that's a safety thing. Otherwise, if they start to fly, uh, they might make nasty things. All right, so do you guys have another question? Yes, I, I don't know. Uh, do you, did you hear the last one, right? Why, do you, when you have matter and matter, why do we have mesons when they annihilate? I don't know if. Oh, you know, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Mixing up matter, antimatter, and mesons is a very big mix. So, what is the first question about matter and antimatter? If the matter and antimatter annihilate themselves, why do we have mesons? Oh, okay. okay. So, so the, the first. So, let me just rephrase that question. The question that we are asking ourselves here at CERN is, if matter and antimatter would annihilate themselves at the beginning of the universe, how come there is anything at all and this is a, a question for which we do not have an answer and even our present theory the standard model there are some things which are not symmetric between matter and antimatter but that the symmetry is not big enough to explain all the visible universe that we know and love so mesons are just one type of particle but basically everything we are made of everything we see we don't know why that stuff is around how come there's so much of it? Okay, well, thank you. We have one more. How do you find something you are not looking for? 
like the unknown particles? Yes. Yeah. So, so there there are two things here. One of them is that there are very creative people that create all kinds of theoretical models, but they are called theorists. So they come up with some really crazy ideas that we can test. I mean, the ones that we cannot test, they are not even crazy. They're, it's not even, uh, I think the answer, the, 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 the qualification is they are not even wrong because they cannot be proven wrong. So those are not any theory, but But, but how by the way, that's you... not a theory. <laughs> You know. It's not a scientific theory. Yes, it's yeah, a, it's exactly. an opinion. It's an idea. Um, now, how how do you search for them? So one of the things has to do with we look we like we pick up on things that we already know about, and uh, then we try to see if they are slightly different from what we expect. So if they are different from what the existing theory, like the standard model, predicts. It could be that there is something else happening in there. And uh, now I have to get back on the elevator and we are going to lose the connection. I'll be with you, back with you in a few minutes. Yeah, thank um, you. So you guys stay with me here in the control center while Andre is returning. Um, yeah, he's 97 meters underground. So uh, the LHC and uh, our detectors um, are like 100 meters underground, some are more, others are less. Um, you asked before um, what type of people work at CMS, but at CERN we have also a lot of people and uh, in many fields, you know, we even have nurses, we have people in IT, in informatics, we have civil engineering, we have surveyors, so we have there are lots of, lots of opportunities to join CERN, uh, especially for students. So you should check out the, um, like the internships they have because it's really great to be here and to do an internship here. And it doesn't matter if you don't know anything of physics or if you love physics, uh, you can always just check what's available. Um, I don't know if you have other questions or questions that aren't physics related while Andrea gets back. Thank you yes. so much for so, the visit. Really, really I just, nice. Let, let me just add something to this thing of the jobs because people always ask about uh, jobs and um, the CMS is not a CERN experiment. CMS is an experiment at CERN. And in this way, I mean, the, the, the reason I'm saying this is that for instance, I think that uh, there, there are Brazilian institutes participating in CMS and CMS is made of all the institutes that participate in the collaboration. And that's the big difference between the jobs that you can find in the different places. And as Inish was saying, most of the CERN employees are not physicists. So there's a lot of administrative personnel because you know there's a lot of logistics, there's a lot of engineering uh, because CERN itself builds like the buildings and the, the, you know, cuts the grass and stuff like that. But the experiments and the detectors, those are built by the collaborations that come to CERN. Thank you for that. I, we have some students that are still deciding which engineer they're going to take. Do you have any advice? Which will be the most, most in demand engineer nowadays? Or is at CERN at least? I, I think you should go with what you like to do and not what's in demand. And one way to see it is also by joining internships and to try to decide what you like to do. Um, but I would say like there's always jobs for people who are very good. So it's not like ah, there's no like there's no jobs for this domain. Well, it depends on how good you are, because if you are really good, then there's always going to be a place for you. Um, well, as I said before, here at CERN, we have a lot of, and Andrea said, we have a lot of engineers, so it kind of depends. I think there are a lot of like informatic people. Um, there are a lot of surveyors, so it really depends. You can see Andrea coming now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do, you do, do you know if CERN offers internship for high school students? Because I know they offer for undergrad students, but about high school? 
We have a summer student internship. Yeah, but that's for university students. Okay. Uh, for high school students, we uh, I don't know about. We have the open lab thing, right? There is a. That's yes. true, and there are this HSSIP. That's for for some uh, for for uh, secondary school students. Um, I don't know if this this is for the for the the member states i guess right so i think that i think to, to be honest the best way of being introduced to what happens at cern is to locally contacting an institute that is involved in cern activities mm -hmm. that is it's by far the easiest because you get a context that is relevant to the student and uh, without having to cross the ocean and staying abroad and getting visas and all of that so in order to see, because I agree with Inês, do an internship. Go and see how it's done, see how, how things are done. Get in touch with your local institutes that are involved in high energy particle physics. And for instance, in South America, there is a wonderful observatory of the OG experiment, which is in Argentina. I'm sorry, they put it in the wrong country, but you know, what can we do? Can I visit there? Sorry? Because I know they have some master class, but I haven't managed to get uh, visits there. Can we yeah. all go on site to see it? I know, I know that they had open days. So at some point they had open days and it was possible to go and visit. Whether you can bring a whole school, that's that's a good question. Because it's it's also not in a normal place, right? It's in the Atacama Desert. So you probably want to go and get acclimatized and get ready for you know the low pressure, low oxygen environment. I see, I see. But let's keep with the market yeah, yeah. for now. <laughs> right. So, but the, the main point, the main point is that okay. coming to CERN and should probably so never be the first step, especially if you are interested uh, in the physics things. If you're talking about only, the engineering, then yes. But then coming here or coming to Europe, it's a uh, very big uh, master classes. We should mention the master classes. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, had a great time. It was very entertaining, guys. Obrigado do Brasil aqui. Curtimos muito. Eles têm aula daqui a pouco. They're gonna have another lesson. So I have just five minutes left. One thing that the key used by each I was forgetting that. Okay. I never did it. No, sorry, what you're hearing here is the data quality monitoring uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. So, so thank so, you so much. All right. So, thank you very much for joining, for coming. And uh, indeed, there are master classes, there are other activities that can be done, other virtual activities that are great. Nice meeting you and have a nice day. Bye. Evening. Thank you Ciao. very much. Yeah, it was awesome. Da hora, da hora. Very nice. Ciao, ciao. Bye.